The poll is still on the screen. Uh, I switched it off, so I think uh, maybe put an X from your side. Yep. Okay, thanks. Okay, and we are live on YouTube right now. That's great. So, hello, Eva. You are here? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, How are you? Hey, Wendy. Hey. Hello, Dr. Fan. Thanks for joining us. Hi. So, uh, Dr. Prof. Wat might join us shortly. Oh, okay. Honey, is uh, YouTube China still okay? Is uh, YouTube functioning okay? I cannot. The video is not available, is it? Asil? No, oh, it is. One second. You mean you will show this slide? Yeah, I'm showing this slide. Yeah. I cannot see it. Uh, because there's delay, there's a one minute delay. Okay. okay. Check. Okay, can you see it now? No. It's written video unavailable. Is it? Uh, uh, you need to... Um, okay, I will WhatsApp you the other link. It's not the same link as last time. Yeah, I try to... I'll log in through the account. Okay. Yeah. I can see from my side. It looks can okay. See it? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. We have seven seventeen watching now. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Twenty watching. <laughs> <laughs> For your information, today we have uh, 553 registered participants.
a lot. Can you all hear me? Yes. 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 <coughs> it is great. So currently we have 71 uh, participants in a Zoom. How many YouTube, uh, how many person is watching in the YouTube now? 29. 29, okay. So in the Zoom, we have 81. Shall we make a start now? Yes, sure. Wendy, can we start now? Yes, sure. Right, okay. So, Asya, can you project the first slide? Okay, thank you. Right, let's start. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the se second session of the 13th Asian College of Medical Physics workshop with the team Radiobiology in the era of precision medicine. This three series course is organized by Professor Dr. Eva Beza from the University of South Australia, Associ uh, Associate Professor Dr. Yong Chai Hong from the Taylor University, Malaysia, and myself, Ek Hao Eng from Hospital Kuala Lumpur, Today, we have two eminent speakers, Dr. Vandy Phillips from the Royal Adelaide Hospital, Australia, and Professor Dr. Ismail from the National University of Malaysia. For those who have missed the last session and would like to catch up, you can view the recorded lectures in a YouTube by searching using keyword ACOMP, ACOM. So I said, can you move to the next slide? So some housekeeping rules, please turn off your audio and video during, uh, during the session. This workshop is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube. The link is shared on the Zoom chat. And please uh, post your question and or comments in the chat box on the Zoom or YouTube. And please fill in the feedback form at the end of the workshop to receive your certificate. Okay, so next one, please. So this is the uh, schedule uh, during the workshop. And we had the two uh, lectures during the last Friday, radiobiology of tissue interaction with radiation and the LQ model, DCP and NTCP calculation with, uh, by Professor Dr. Eva Beza. And today we arranged for two uh, eminent speakers uh, with interesting talk today. The first one will be uh, given by Dr. Vandy Phillips about the clinical application of LQ model radiobiology of altered fractionation, hypoxia, extension of LQ uh, model for SABR. And secondly, we'll go into more clinical experience sharing by Professor Dr. Fort Ismail, which uh, will talk about uh, treatment interruption or retreatment combined therapy. So we will leave the Q&A session after two talks to allow small times for discussion. And for all participants, please post your comments and or questions in the chat box. Uh, so next one, please. So without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker today, Dr. Vandy Phillips. Dr. Van, Dr. Phillips uh, is a senior radiation oncology medical physicist uh, and a lead medical physicist for the high dose rate cervix brachytherapy services at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. She obtained her PhD in radiobiological tumor hypoxia modeling and received a ROM certification in 2011. She served as a radiation oncology TEAP public preceptor and ACP SEM advisory forum 
from 2018 to 19. And she also won several awards such as ACP, uh, SCPESM, Kenneth Clark Journal Award in 2011, and Boyce uh, Worthley Young Achiever Award in 2012. And her current interest is in high dose rate brachytherapy, computational uh, radiobiology modeling, radiation safety, clinical trial ethics, as well as teaching and training. Without further ado, I'll pass the floor to Dr. Phillips, please. Thank you very much for your um, kind introduction. I'll just share my screen. Now, can we see that slideshow, everybody? Yes, I can see. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you for having me. I'm honoured to be invited to um, present this um, third lecture in this ACOMP series for radiation biology. So I'm very happy to be here and present um, an overview of these very important topics. And um, we only have 45 minutes approximately to get through some very important topics, which I could speak for hours about. So we'll get underway. And I'm sorry if it has to go a little bit quickly, but you'll have the slides to look back on later at anything that looked a bit um, slightly complicated with the equations, but we won't make it complicated. All right. So here are our four topics for today. As um, we've said, it's about the clinical application of the linear quadratic model. So a brief reminder, and then some nice equations to show how we do use this theory in every day in the clinic. A bit about altered fractionation schedules, tumor hypoxia, which is something I've studied in depth um, and I'm very interested in, and then extending some of these theories and talking about SABER. So on to the first topic. So as you've probably seen um, much in the past and from one of the first lectures, uh, the basic um, LQ expression for survival probability of a cell or a group of cells after irradiation um, has a value between zero and one and is given by the expression you see there. So I'm just moving some of my windows out of the way. Now you'll see the alpha and beta parameters in this equation, and they are tissue as well as being characteristic dependent parameters. Um, and the alpha beta ratio, which is something we've probably all heard of, is um, known as the intrinsic radiosensitivity parameter. Now for radiation therapy delivered over multiple doses, which it usually is in the clinic, the equation becomes this expression where we see the N and then the total dose D is ND. So a nice little plot showing what this looks like. We see here a survival curve plotted surviving fraction of cells versus the dose D. And alpha beta as of alpha beta ratio there in units of gray represents the dose at which a single hit, so at which alpha, the single hit, and beta, the double hit uh, contribution, cell kill is equal. So uh, just a little reminder of what that means. If we draw a tangent to the curve, you'll see in this second plot here, the alpha and the beta component going down to that tangent and then up to the tangent of the curve section um, is equal. So the alpha beta ratio in this plot here would be five. Now looking at the green arrows, uh, many tumors have a high alpha beta ratio, um, around 10 to 15 gray, with a larger alpha and a smaller beta component with a straighter initial part of the curve, as we see. And then the curve, um, and then they have a less curved section later. But with the low alpha beta tumors, you see um, not um, a great response at first, such as that dashed line, but then a greater uh, curved section later on. But some tumors do have this lower alpha beta ratio though, um, such as breast and prostate cancers, um, as well as the normal tissues. But a lot of the tumors are the high alpha beta ratio. So with that um, summary presented, we'll move on to a reminder about how we then use this theory in the clinic. Um, in terms of E, the clinical effect, the effect E is related to the log of the survival probability. So minus LN of that survival. 
Now, the EQD2 concept was devised in the 1980s for a simple way of calculating the ISO effect of these dose regimens, or what we call fractionation schedules, so breaking up the dose into smaller parts. And here E is equated for both sides of the regimens, and we see the expressions, and this is all then comparing a regimen to a conventional type 2 gray per fraction regimen. So if we equate the two regimens for the, for the ISO effect, this gives us an EQD2 expression. And that's a very useful and quick method of comparing the regimens for their predicted cell kill. So we have the both effects and we end up with an EQD2, the equivalent dose in two gray fractions of the test schedule that you're trying to evaluate. So what the total delivered dose is going to be of your schedule the different dose per fraction, whether it be more or less than two gray per fraction, plus the alpha beta of your tumor, divided by the standard or the conventional two gray per fraction over that same alpha beta. And that gives you a good um, estimate, a generalized estimate of the equivalent dose you might be giving overall with that new regimen. One other concept we'll discuss before we look at some actual calculations is the BED. So the biologically um, equivalent or effective dose. Um, it's another useful quick method of comparing regimens, but without reference to a standard or conventional two gray regimen. So here we have the BED is the effect divided by that alpha parameter. And BED is related to effect and EQD2, but more represents the dose required um, for the same effect as the fraction size is 10 towards zero or where the multi-hit events for the DNA go towards zero. So it's another very useful expression. And now we might want to consider here with BED especially that tumours are actually still growing during treatment. They can be growing back even faster as you'll um, um, hear more about. So tumours are still growing and they may do this at the same or higher rates. Hence, quicker treatments and no treatment breaks are sometimes um, preferable, but that is limited by the normal tissue tolerance. So with the surviving um, fraction or the survival probability equations, we often see some extra terms added accounting for this regrowth. We can add an exponential with a regrowth type parameter that can be time dependent. There might be time, um, there might be regrowth the whole time, or there might be a time at which there is a kickoff time of that accelerated growth. So these are expressions which you can find in much of the literature. And here we can extend that BED, biologically effective dose, to having, if we look at this latter equation, this is the one I like to use more, we have the initial component and then this extra parameter. This is just ln2 over uh, the alpha parameter and a potential doubling time of the tumour. So if we read the green box down here, you can see what all these terms mean. But the important thing is we have a time of kickoff of this um, regrowth, whether it be as soon as treatment starts or you can put in an accelerated rate of growth um, at a certain time, perhaps two or three weeks into treatment. So sorry about all the equations here, but these are quite useful um, equations that we apply uh, at the Royal Island Hospital, uh, even especially with the brachytherapy program that I'm involved in, to try and um, equate and judge how to add regimens together, whether it be external beam plus brachytherapy or comparing just two different schedules. And we want to know that either BD or the EQD2 of these schedules. And if we want to account for the tumours regrowing, um, perhaps head and neck cancers, cervix cancers that have that accelerated regrowth during treatment is possible, we can add these extra parameters in. So that being said, we'll move on to some calculations that prove um, some of these theories and show you what's going on. So in this example, we're just going to compare two EBRT schedules using the basic EQD2, equivalent dose up to two gray fractions, um, to show how the dose per fraction may affect things. So first example, the conventional schedule, um, which as I've said is two gray per fraction, often five days per week in the clinic, and around seven weeks of treatment. And let's compare that now to three grays per fraction, which we'll learn later is a type of hypofractionation where we increase the dose. So three grays per fraction, five days a week, but then only for four and a half weeks. 
Now, what effect is that going to have? Is it the same clinical effect? Let's put that into some EQD2 calculations. So the total doses are slightly different, the conventional being slightly higher. But when we put those values using an alpha beta of 10, we see the equivalent dose in two gray fractions is actually more for the second schedule. So it's having more of a clinical effect on the tumour because the doses per fraction are larger. It's not a huge effect, but it is larger. Example two, that same conventional treatment compared to perhaps two smaller fractions per day. We can get more treatments in if we treat twice a day and we can do that over overall less time. So let's see how those calculations work out. We have a dose, um, again, 70 gray for the conventional. Now, if we work out that um, the B schedule there, the total dose is 72 gray. But in equivalent dose in two gray fractions, we're actually delivering less overall effective dose because we are breaking those fractions up um, so severely into small 1.2 gray fractions. So you can see how um, this could be useful if you're considering using different fractionation schemes or if you're a um, part of clinical trial groups, you're trying to devise different ways of um, you know, testing different regimens, what should be trialed next or working with animals. Um, these basic calculations are very useful. Um, now let's look at the normal tissues because it's not just the tumours we're worried about, of course, it's protecting the normal tissues and that's one of our hardest um, jobs. So comparing those same schedules, we saw that it was 70 grey with conventional um, and that's um, just the, the dose delivered. Um, now if we put the EQD2 in for that same three grey per fraction um, schedule, but now with an alpha beta of three representing the average organ at risk or normal tissue, we see that the actual effective dose delivered there in EQD2 is 81 gray. So that's quite a lot more. That's 11 gray more, which of course, the more that is, you know, it's not good for our organs at risk. We wouldn't be aiming to deliver that full prescription dose to the organs at risk. This is just an example. Um, but you can see how big the dose um, increases by when we've dropped that alpha beta. And for the conventional um, versus the 1.2 gray twice per day, you can see how it drops. So we've gone from um, the 70 gray, the tumor EQD2 with alpha beta 10 was 67, but the organ at risk with alpha beta 3 dropped to 60.5. So this is great for our organs at risk. So if we've got lots of organs at risk, hyperfractionation or twice even three times per day treatment could be a good option or something to trial. So just to note here, um, at the bottom of the screen, I've just put the alpha beta ratios that I've used for these equations as we've gone through, and that no regrowth has been accounted for here as yet. This is just assuming we've got a snapshot of the tumour and we're aiming to kill it very basic fashion with our external beam without the tumour um, regrowing, which of course is not the real case. This is um, a basic prediction. Okay, now um, a bit more, um, another nice example for um, cervix cancer in this case, and this has come from my clinic, this is what we do. So let's pretend, um, or let's calculate 1.8 gray per fraction, five days a week for five weeks, but then adding some brachytherapy. So we're gonna be adding these values. So we have our 45 gray absolute delivered dose, EQD2 of 44, because of that slight drop in dose per fraction. And then the brachytherapy dose, three times um, eight and a half gray. So this is our brachytherapy boost for our cervix cancer cases, has an EQD2 of 38.4. And this is with an alpha beta 10. So overall, EQD2 is around 83 gray. And the doctors will prescribe this based on international recommendations such as um, Jack Estro. So this is one of the ones that we use. But now looking at the normal tissues. So we're very much concerned with bladder dose, um, uh, sigmoid, small bowel and rectal doses. Now let's just say they all have an alpha beta of three in this scenario. And we usually look at the dose to the worst two cc, so two cubic centimetres of the bladder. I'm assuming it gets the full dose. Um, 
we would have delivered dose of 43 gray um, with external beam and then adding because of that drop um, well, because of the increase in dose per fraction, we would have, and the drop of alpha beta, the EQD2 of around um, 89, oh, sorry, 59. So overall there, the EQD2 adds up to um, around 102 gray if the bladder, the worst 2 cc of the bladder, got that full prescription. Now that is too high. Basic calculator says that is too high and from clinical trials and international recommendations, we want to aim for 90 or less. So we drop the tolerance for the bladder um, in our brachy schedules and look for around 85 to 90% of the prescription going to the bladder, not the full 100% sort of isodose going through the bladder. So if we reduce the prescription or the allowable dose to around seven and a half instead of the eight and a half gray per fraction for the bladder, we bring that EQD2 down to around the, the 90 mark. So I think that's a nice um, example of what, how we do apply these theories in the clinic and bring our organs at risk down to um, acceptable levels before we treat with brachy, which is a boost after the external beam treatment. Okay, let's look at the BD calculations now and quickly add in, um, no, and still note this is without the accelerated repopulation at this point. The BD for this same um, schedule, for the external beam plus brachy for cervix cancer would give um, a total dose of 53 plus the 47 in EQD2, which gives a BD of around um, 100 gray. Now, if we do add in that um, kickoff time for accelerated repopulation, which is something I like to um, calculate and look at the parameters for, and I've done modeling work for this, um, if we have a kickoff time of around the three week mark um, on average, um, a potential doubling time of the tumor of around seven days, and that can drastically reduce. It could have been a few weeks before treatment. And as the treatment progresses and that tumor goes into injury response mode, it can be accelerating in its growth quite a lot. So for a general parameter there of about seven days, there's a potential doubling time of the tumor in that response mode. And an alpha of 0.3, this is how the BD calculation comes out. So the BD calculation with this extra um, black part to account for that regrowth ends up being 88.7 gray. So that's, um, you can see how we've reduced the effective dose we're giving to the tumor because of that regrowth. And it accounts for around 0.3 gray per day. And that's actually a really conservative view. It could be substantially more. Um, publications have shown up to 0 0.5, 0 0.6, or even more gray per day that we may need to apply extra to account for that really drastic regrowth during therapy. Um, so obviously treatment breaks aren't going to be very good for those type of treatments. It's just growing back at such a rate and we need to finish that treatment um, if at all possible. All right, so that was our examples of um, how we use these L LQ theory in the clinic with some EQD2 and BED calculations. And we'll just summarize that. Um, and then I'm afraid we'll have to move on to the next topic. Um, so LQ theory for fractionated radiotherapy is based on dose per fraction, the number of fractions, and then the alpha and beta using the double single and double hit theory to DNA. And alpha beta ratio can be thought of an, as an approximate intrinsic radio sensitivity parameter. There are many more parameters that can affect the rate of cell kill. So this is more the intrinsic before environmental factors. Alpha beta ratios are very useful in everyday radiotherapy for estimating the sensitivity of a tumor or the surrounding organs at risk and how they may be changing to the dose fraction size. So the alpha beta ratio tells us how sensitive the tissue or the tumor is going to be to changing the dose per fraction. That's a very important thing to remember. So overall, the high alpha beta tumors tend to be the earlier responding tumors. Uh, they are less dependent on fraction size and it's the total time that matters more because they're growing quickly. Conversely, the low alpha beta tumors and organs at risk respond more slowly at first, but then they are more sensitive to those larger doses per fraction. And the use of those cell survival curves and the EQD2 and BED 
I put our theory into practice in the clinic to this day with simple or more sometimes um, more complex equations if we add more and more parameters um, used to compare or add dose regimens for their effectiveness on cell kill. Okay, that's the first topic done and we're gonna straight away move on to the next one, which is related, of course. We're talking about fractionation here and what it actually means to have altered fractionation. Um, so as we've just seen, the small doses um, are given in, in radiotherapy. We can't give the whole dose all at once. That would be great for the tumor, but we are gonna hurt the, the normal tissues of that person. So we deliver small radiation doses D, delivered in N treatments over a total time, capital T, where the total dose is ND. So fractionation is essential to spare those normal tissues and changing the fraction size D away from the conventional, which is around that 1.8 to 2.2, we would say is the conventional dose per day in one fraction. And that's called altered fractionation. Uh, we've seen that low alpha beta tumors can benefit the most um, from the higher doses per fraction. And this then does alter the total time because we're increasing the dose per fraction. We don't need to do it as long. However, to achieve acceptable toxicity, we may have to reduce the total dose. And there's a limit to how much we can do that because we need to kill all the cells. We can't give below a certain threshold of dose either, depending on the tumor. I think this plot um, is quite useful. We can see here if we don't fractionate and it's just delivered as single whole doses, we have the blue curves. But for um, large alpha betas, if we fractionate, each dose fraction is having an effect to lessen the cell kill to the tumor and the normal tissues, but hopefully more so to the normal tissues without affecting the tumor too greatly. But for those large alpha beta tumors, it's going to increase from the blue to the red slightly, but for the larger and for late normal tissue effects, um, there's gonna be more of a difference where the alpha beta is smaller. So I think I've just summarized what I've written there. Um, so the high alpha beta tumors are faster responding at first, but have a smaller beta component. Therefore the total time T is more critical. And to reduce T without invoking toxicity, the smaller doses per fraction or multiple doses per day can be delivered. All right, so let's move on to what these altered fractionation schedules are called and how we define them. We've seen what our conventional schedule often looks like there, and I think we all know that now. Um, but the altered schedules, I've got a list here, um, and I've started with the hyper fractionation, so reducing dose per fraction. We can do this in a pure way where the dose per fraction just decreases, um, but this is difficult for tumor control. As an impure way, we do the above, but also with a total dose increase. Because we're killing less of the tumor in each fraction, often the total dose will have to, to increase to achieve this. Um, the accelerated fractionation, overall this means reducing the overall time. So we could um, increase the dose delivered per week um, above that normal 10 to 12 gray, which would be the more conventional. Um, but this is difficult uh, due to toxicity. Um, so as an impure way, we do the above, but with the total dose reduced or with a boosted field, what we call a concomitant boost, perhaps near the end of the schedule to a reduced field to try and get that accelerated kill in. So hyper, small dose for fractions, accelerated, um, reducing the total time. Three, we have a combination um, of the hyper and accelerated called heart or even chart, a continuous hyperfractionated accelerated radiotherapy. So there's a lot of words there to take in if you haven't heard them before. So this would be accelerating, reducing total time as well as splitting up the doses into multiple doses per day to get lots of, um, you know, to try and combat that accelerated regrowth, but also splitting up the doses quite a lot to help the normal tissue response. Number four there, a split course. So um, not having to stop because of a side effects, but on purpose, having a treatment break applied to the course. Um, and maybe that would be a few gap, uh, weeks gap um, in order to allow for repair. And then hypofractionation, where we deliver um, more than 2.2 gray per fraction. In this as well, we must reduce the total time because of how we're delivering that, those high doses. And an example is the high dose rate brachytherapy sort of, um, technique. 
as well as Sabre, which we'll hear more about um, near the end of the lecture. Um, so for examples of prostate, the low alpha beta um, tumors can uh, really um, have a good advantage with the hypofractionation because of their low alpha beta. Okay, now that we've seen what they are, um, so those basic schedules are called for altered fractionation, this is a nice chart just graphically showing us what these schedules look like, where a little line represents um, the dose for the day. So conventional, five small lines there, weekend break, and we have in this example, um, six weeks. Hyperfractionation, we deliver twice per day. Now they do need to leave a few hours gap in between, often six hours is quoted in the literature. And then for this example, one, two, three, four, five, six weeks of the, the smaller doses per fraction. The chart example, three fractions a day, non-stop. So a very um, severe schedule. And we have some others here as well. We don't need to go through all of it, but um, you get the idea of how then temporarily that would be spaced out with these different doses per fraction. And then just a nice graphic there of different clinical trials that have tried the hyper and the hypo um, fractionation types. Most of them there in the hyper where they've used um, smaller doses, but often two or even three times per day. Um, so these sorts of trials have been going on for um, quite a few decades now, um, often with the, the multiple doses or hyperfractionation showing to be of benefit for the high alpha beta tumors such as head and neck. Whether or not they are um, logistically feasible in clinic is another thing entirely, um, but splitting up the dose delivering an overall high dose still, but allowing the normal tissues to repair does um, look to be beneficial. So benefits of that hyperfractionation I was just speaking to, um, especially good for late normal um, responding tissues with the low alpha beta. Um, it can help flatten out an oxygen related curve and we'll see more about what, how oxygen matters in the next section um, on hypoxia. But the effect of oxygen might not be as severe with those smaller doses per fraction. And it allows time for reoxygenation, and we'll learn more about that as well in the next section um, because of the length of the schedule there. Disadvantages, it's more time intensive, of course, to have lots of doses um, to deliver to your patient. We do need the many hours break between fractions to allow for repair, which can be inconvenient. Total dose often has to be reduced um, due to the shortened time, so care must be taken not to do that too severely or we're not going to get the like, amount of cell Q overall that we need. And it may not invoke um, a response like an immune response, and we'll learn more about that in section four. Um, it may take the very large doses per fraction to get the advantage of some extra effects that are happening rather than the standard um, what's re represented in the LQ model with single and double hit theory. So that's a very interesting area of research as well. From my own um, literature study and some modelling work I've done, these are all the, the schedules uh, just for head and neck um, cancer trials that I've um, worked with in the past um, to simulate tumour growth and radiotherapy. There's many, many different options for how to fractionate or use altered fractionation to try and combat um, these fast growing head and neck tumours. So it's, um, it's still an area of um, great interest and in research. So you can look back on that later in the slide. I think we better um, move on. But you can see lots of the things have been tried there, often with the hyperfractionation um, winning out in the end in that we can control the tumours more easily without having lots of side effects. The results from that modelling work that um, myself and Professor Bizak have been involved in um, have produced graphs such as this, where we can actually simulate a tumour getting radiotherapy and seeing every day how the tumour is responding and the cell number that it's been reduced to over those dose fractions. Um, and, you know, we can see how these trials in a simulated tumour have worked out and compare them to what happened in real life to try and validate the, the response models. This particular example was for hypoxic tumours, virtual tumours, where um, reoxygenation was also modelled. And in this modelling work, we found that the 1.1 or 1.2 gray per fraction was indeed um, the most beneficial. So 
So to summarize the altered fractionation, um, we've seen that this means moving away from that standard two gray per fraction, we're adjusting dose per fraction, often that total time has to change. And our goal would be to aim to deliver the EQD2 or BED that we get from a conventional schedule that we have seen, it's tried and tested, we know that dose works, but we wanna try and deliver that in a more convenient way or a less toxic way. So small dose per fraction, such as the bi-daily or twice per day, are often beneficial for the early responding normal tissues to lower toxicity without compromising the high alpha beta tumor cell kill, which doesn't respond as much because of the high alpha beta. Um, and we've seen here that large doses per fraction are actually delivered clinically and have been trialed, like the UK chart trial. It had net used very large doses per fraction and did so continuously. Um, and that and Sabre, we'll, we'll talk about that coming up, and high dose rate brachytherapy use very large doses per fraction. And they are in theory beneficial for low alpha beta tumors and also for many other tumors which have accelerated repopulation because we're just reducing that overall time so severely, the tumors don't have much of a chance to grow back or accelerate their growth at all because we're treating so quickly for that treatment duration. All right, so that's the summary of our second topic there. And we're going to move on quickly to hypoxia. Um, I'm very passionate about um, tumor hypoxia and modeling this type of um, phenomenon. And we won't be able to talk about everything to do with hypoxia here in around 10 or 15 minutes, but um, I'll try and cover quite a few topics. So apologies if we go quite quickly. Um, overall, hypoxia means a lack of adequate oxygenation to tissues or cells. I really like this picture. It shows us what the vasculature of normal tissue looks like. And an example of how chaotic um, the tumor um, vascular structure can be. So hypoxia often occurs in tumors due to a lack of oxygen with typical oxygen partial pressure. You'll see this PO2 parameter through these slides with a value about less than 10 with units of millimeters of mercury. And this arises, as we've said, from the inadequate vascular system that the tumor grows. At first, tumors may not have their own vascular system and they may rely on diffusion from the outer tissues, blood supply. But once angiogenesis is invoked um, and the tumor starts to grow its own blood vessel system, it won't be as nice and orderly as its normal tissue counterpart. It's um, likely to be very chaotic, patchy, leaky, etc. So there's a natural range of oxygen levels in different healthy tissues approximately, and that's a large range, between 20 and 80 millimetres of mercury. Um, but the limited diffusion of oxygen can lead to permanent types of hypoxia in tumours. And the main reason is the distance away from a functioning blood vessel. That was observed many decades ago now, mid last century, that the hypoxic fraction, which is the volume of cells with inadequate oxygen, uh, increases with the distance from blood vessels. Cells with no oxygen contact um, can be termed anoxic, and you might see well-oxygenated cells be named normoxic for normal or aerobic, so having the air or O2 available. So it was initially thought to arise in cells situated at distances of at least 100 to 150 micrometres from the functioning blood vessels, but now distances quite a bit smaller have been observed. And even more recent studies show hypoxic cells of various levels of hypoxia can be seen very close, so 25 to 50 micrometres from a blood vessel. And that's in the order of only one or two or three cells, depending on cell size. The permanent um, type of hypoxia, permanent occlusions of blood vessels create areas with low blood oxygen levels, and this can lead to what we call chronic hypoxia. And I've got some diagrams coming up to display this. Um, An acute hypoxia is a more dynamic form of hypoxia because of its transient nature and occurs in tumor cells which are dependent on blood vessels that have temporary blockages or perhaps temporary leaks or blind ends, so shut ends or shunts to the um, vasculature. So some nice um, diagrams here from the latest Hall edition um, show us a, a blood vessel, with normally oxygenated cells leading to chronic hypoxia and eventually anoxic or no oxygen cells, which can become necrotic. And then acute hypoxia forming where there might be a temporary blockage. 
So these uh, these two um, illustrations display this spatially, sort of what these two different types of hypoxia. Both can have the same effect on radiosensitivity, although maybe slightly differently. If a chronic hypoxic cell has been a chronic um, for a long period of time, and there's still research going on about that. But both types of hypoxia mean reduced oxygen levels, and that can affect radiosensitivity. So hypoxic cells are more resistant to ionizing radiation than well-oxygenated cells for low LET, so linear energy transfer type beams such as our X-rays, gamma rays, electrons, so our standard EBRT or superficial or brachytherapy type beams. So cells are more resistant, it's a nice quote, in the, in the complete absence of oxygen, but see a rapid increase in their sensitivity as that oxygen partial pressure rises um, from around 0.5 to 20 millimetres of mercury with a sigmoid trend. So that was a nice quote from Walters and Brown. Um, so in the 90s, lots of research on this, and these are two nice plots showing us what normal um, subcutaneous um, so this is a, a head neck example and then epithelial tissue. You can see a, an almost normal type distribution between 20 and 80 for normal tissue and then quite deprived of oxygen in that tumour response. And these, this data was taken with an Eppendorf probe, um, so actually invasively probing the tumours and seeing what their level of oxygenation was. So this is, these are plotted in as a histogram. So the percentage of cells with each of these levels. So many of the cells have a, um, oops, sorry, have an oxygen level below that 10 value, which is where we say hypoxia um, is defined. Another plot showing the sigmoid trends, and this is some data I've used in my own modeling work to model um, tumor hypoxia in a cell population in a simulated tumor. So that's a type of trend. Many of the cells have the low oxygen values. So that means many of our cells have the possibility of being um, resistant to our therapy. So very, very briefly, we won't go into all the chemistry here, but why is this happening? What difference does the oxygen make? So the difference in radio sensitivity is given by the higher capacity of hypoxic cells um, to repair DNA damage induced by free radicals, such as the hydroxy radical, the OH radical. There's lots of different chemical reactions happening when our um, say our photons or our x-rays are interacting with molecules in our cells before um, the DNA is actually hopefully damaged. So in this example, oh, I think someone's unmuted. Um, we have ionizing radiation entering, um, often hitting a water molecule because that's um, quite common around our DNA, and then these hydroxy radicals being formed. And there are more potent radicals, but that is the most common. Now, in the presence of oxygen, further reactions can happen to lock in the damage and make it more permanent. So in the presence of oxygen, the damage is more likely to be permanent and affecting the sugar backbone of the DNA, um, or we term it fixed. So permanent or fixed, not as in fixing damage, it's fixed in. Um, aerobic cells are less able then to successfully repair the DNA and hence the damage becomes permanent. And the oxygen must be there at or within milliseconds of that initial reaction and the free radicals being created to then be able to become a part of the further chemical reactions and have this um, permanent effect on um, the DNA um, um, repair. Um, so this resistance due to hypoxia is classically known as the oxygen fixation hypothesis. And this uses the theory of an indirect or two-step process of radiation damage. First, the generation or induction of the free radicals, sometimes called oxidants, and then the free radicals going on to interact with DNA. So nice little um, diagram here. We have our ionizing radiation and our DNA. We have um, a free radical that has interacted perhaps with a base pair on the DNA and it's formed um, a radical on the DNA. Now this is more easily fixed chemical restitution when there is no oxygen around. If there is oxygen around, this has further reaction, this double OH and that damage can become fixed. 
So um, we have a nice little quote here. I don't think we'll have time to read it all, but um, that's a nice paper summarising all this um, effects to do with free radicals and how we are damaging the DNA. So I think we'll move on. I hope that makes sense to everybody. So the actual definition of this oxygen enhancement ratio, because that's how we're going to go on and then use this um, phenomenon and, and try and take advantage of it or combat it. So historically, the OER was calculated by the dose needed by hypoxic cells compared to aerated cells for the same effect, so the ISO effect level. Um, and this is the type of equation and plot you might see in the older literature. However, this is the one we, we use more now. And, and the OER is now more commonly reported and plotted as the ratio of ISO effective doses under anoxic or zero oxygen to the hypoxic condition you're interested in. And this is also termed the hypoxia reduction factor. So this is the one here to remember with a value going from zero to around three. So it's often three times harder to kill um, the hypoxic cells if you've got that type of difference between the oxygen levels. Um, for X-ray radiotherapy, the OER, as I've said, can be up to three, which, which is, um, seems quite drastic, but it can have up to that level. And this means it might take three times the dose to have the same level of cell kill. So it is an important effect we should be aware of. Um, and then the OER, or the, the value that you produce from this type of um, research, can be used as a dose modifying factor in equations such as LQ theory, if you extend it for oxygen theory. These are two plots from my um, previous modeling work showing the different oxygen enhancement ratio plots I've used for different doses per fraction, also based on um, other literature data. Um, but this can make a difference if we're using the high per fractionated schedule and very low doses per fraction, the oxygen effect um, is thought to be quite a bit less. Oops, sorry about that. And the plot underneath is the top OER plot, but converted to a probability of cell death versus PO2, which was actually then applied in some modeling work um, with simulated tumors. So the same data converted to the way that was needed in, in the model. All right, a little bit about reoxygenation and what that means. Um, fortunately, tumors, um, as the tumors shrink, they have less active cells consuming oxygen and they can also diffuse more oxygen into them from the surrounding tissue. There's less mechanical pressures closing those vessels because um, the tumors are getting smaller. So lots of things are aiding this reoxygenation process. So this is a good thing when we call this um, a reoxygenation, I term it ROX for short. Um, and it's one of those R's of radiobiology, which you would have heard about um, in the first lecture. I've done some research in the past on reoxygenation and, and tried to model it, but this was a little um, animal experiment showing um, if we actually can probe tumours, and this is a fibre optic probe, can we actually see or measure this hypo, um, reoxygenation happening as we irradiate tumours? And even in these small tumours, this is a small head and neck tumour subcutaneously implanted into the hind leg of these little nude mice, um, that the oxygen levels did indeed gradually rise, more so at the, at the very end of a quite accelerated but still fractionated schedule. So these mice had three or five gray per fraction delivered to their, their, um, their tumours on their hind legs. And we could see or measure this um, oxygen levels rising with a fibre optic probe. So reoxygenation is important to try and exploit during planning um, if we can for like a human radiotherapy course when the fraction number or the total time is large. There has to be time enough to try and account for this. So more than a few weeks. Um, from the modeling work that I've used this data for, these are the type of curves that the simulated tumors were using. So as the tumors were growing and then shrinking again, trying to use different PO2 curves to simulate the type of oxygen available at different stages of the growth or different stages of the, the tumor shrinking again. So it's a very dynamic process and hard to um, always take account of, but it can have a big difference. So how does this affect actual um, human tumor outcomes? Or well, two um, examples from the literature are here showing disease-free um, survival 
for tumours on average that had this PO2 more or less than 10 with very, very different outcomes there for the high versus low oxygenated tumours. And um, Horseman and Overgaard presented this a few years ago showing the less or more hypoxic tumours, um, it does really have an impact on the overall survival of patients. So um, overall survival, disease-free survival, local regional failure, so regrowth basically in the local region of the primary tumour. Um, hypoxia had an impact in all those cases for those endpoints. So how can we measure this in, in people and how can we try and account for it? Um, to accurately plan a treatment for a hypoxic tumour, um, it's crucial to localise, actually know where this hypoxia is. It might not be in the whole tumour population or the cell population. So the part of the tumour that can be identified as hypoxic is often called the hypoxic subvolume of the tumour. And further, the degree of hypoxia in terms of PO2 can be important as well. Um, this is a consolidation of some literature data showing um, the percent of cells or um, that have certain oxygen levels. Um, so several techniques are used to try and determine these hypoxia levels, either in human or preclinical trials. Some are invasive and some are not invasive. Um, invasive types of ways to, to measure hypoxia are to use different types of probes, whether they be the fiber optic or polarographic electrodes, um, tissue biopsies where a sample is taken um, and even guided by some Doppler ultrasound that can show up these blood flow or in immunohistochemical staining of samples. This is some previous work of, of my group um, showing um, from those mice tumors I showed you earlier, the amount of um, oxygen or the, sorry, the blood vessels in red, hypoxia in green and dividing cells, so proliferative cells in blue and where hypoxia pockets were, even in very small tumours, there were a lot of hypoxia and little pockets hidden all around, even right near um, seemingly functional vessels. So it's very interesting. And this was work using a pimonidazole type stain, which is one um, commonly uh, found in the literature that you can look up more if you're interested. But it really does show nicely where those um, regions of hypoxia are. And they may not necessarily be in the middle of very large tumours. Um, very large tumours can have a necrotic core and a hypoxic core, but it may not be the case. It may be all over the tumour or in little regions where you may not expect it. Uh, there are non-invasive forms of um, imaging um, or determining whether hypoxia is such used in functional imaging. And you'll hear more about that from um, Professor Marku later um, in I think next week's lectures, but basically bioreductive markers um, and even magnetic resonance spectroscopy and hypoxia selective imaging. There are many different types as well. So we won't get all, into all those types today, but just to let you know, there is a range of ways that we can try and analyze hypoxia in human tumors. So trying to overcome this hypoxia. Uh, as tumor hypoxia is one of the main reasons of treatment failure um, in a lot of tumor types, an enormous effort has been expended to develop strategies to overcome it. Some of these methods historically have included um, carbogen breathing, so a different mix of air and high O2 content, um, bioreductive drugs. <clears throat> these unfortunately have so far had limited success due to efficacy or toxicity, but um, still being investigated. Um, dose painting, which is planning and optimizing with those sub hypoxic subvolumes um, with higher doses during the EBRT planning stage or even brachytherapy and also vasoactive agents. And these could work to increase um, the vessel sizes. So open up vessels to allow more blood flow and allow the tumor to reoxygenate itself somewhat. And also the opposite effect, there are active agents that can close blood vessels and um, increase the hypoxia, but hopefully increase it to the extent that there's hardly any oxygen at all. And that prevents um, growth during the treatment, and it may even induce ne necrosis and the, and the tumour starts dying because it's so severely deprived. So it can go both ways there. Uh, this is the uh, uh, quite famous mesonidazole uh, molecule. It's one of those bioreductive uh, markers and there's a um, quite old now, 1980s, but um, um, reference there if you're interested. 
So in summary for hypoxia, many tumours are lacking in adequate oxygen supply and have hypoxia. And this can be up to half of all tumours and it can affect up to 80% of that tumour, especially in head and neck. Um, this leads to radio resistance and hence tumour recurrence after radiotherapy. And this is due to um, fixation of the damage or uh, well, the difference in sensitivity, fixation of damage um, for the oxygenated cells induced by the free radicals. So that creates that OER effect. OER is the oxygen enhancement ratio used to define the ratio of doses required to kill anoxic compared to more oxygenated cells or of any hypoxic level you're interested in. And the values range from approximately one to three. Uh, tumours can reoxygenate while shrinking during a course of fractionated treatment, um, which lessens the negative effect of hypoxia. And there are many different methods to measure or image hypoxia so that radio resistance can be analysed and hopefully accounted for, or drugs can be developed to try and work simultaneously or um, synergistically with the radiotherapy. Um, no one method has been proven to be superior um, and is recommended that all clinics should start using. Um, and the analysis can be very costly and time intensive. So um, watch this space with hypoxia and accounting for it in the clinic. Now, I apologize, I see a red line on my screen. I'm not sure if I did that or if someone else did there. Um, I'm not sure how to get us, so I'll just keep going. And organizers, if, if you knew how to take that red line off, that would be wonderful. So we'll move on to section four and I'll just check how we're going for time. I think we'll need to be quite quick. Um, how do we um, overcome many of these challenges we've seen so far? Um, trying to limit the normal tissue doses, trying to overcome hypoxia. Um, the answers could lie in an EBRT technique called SABER, stereotactic ablative radiation therapy. The SABER uses very high doses per fraction. Uh, commonly in the range of 5 to 18 gray over um, a, a small number of weeks, but it can also deliver up to 30 gray at a time, uh, in one fraction. Um, VMAT or the MIT technique may be utilised to deliver these high doses with the LINAC. Um, often 4 by 12 gray um, is prescribed for SABRE, and that's, um, that's true for most of the tumours, especially the, the, lung, the lung mets um, at my clinic. So it's convenient for patients. There's only a few visits. Beneficial for low alpha beta tumours because we've seen the large dose per fraction is beneficial. Um, beneficial for high alpha beta tumours because there's such a short treatment time, accelerated repopulation would not, hardly have had a chance to take hold. Plus, other interesting things are happening, and this is where it gets um, extremely interesting and moves away from our standard way of thinking of the LQ model. Um, immune system response may invoke additional cell kill and the body can be helping itself and help kill the tumour cells even away from the target site. So controlling some distant small pockets of cells or metastases that are trying to take hold. Um, so this is thought to happen for doses per fraction at about above the 10 grey mark. Um, vascular damage. So we're ablating the vascular endothelial cells in the tumours. Um, so we're damaging the blood vessels, and this can aid in cell kill if dose per fraction, um, and it's quoted around the 10 to 12 gray per fraction. This is what's happening. It's a nice um, plot here in a reference showing how a um, hypoxic tumour with the big dashes, the oxic tumour cell kill, surviving fraction may look. And then if we consider what vascular damage may be doing, at some point there will be vascular damage when we give high doses per fraction. And as the vessels are contracting, we're stopping the growth and we're actually killing cells. How that's actually happening mechanistically, there are many different um, theories, but this is what a simple explanation of the, the cell survival curve would look like. So there's always downsides. However, the overall dose has to be reduced. Um, normal tissues require that limited time to exploit any benefits of reoxygenation if we started out with a hypoxic cell. And the hypoxic cell um, subvolume may increase due to vascular damage. So if we're not fully killing the cells near a vascular um, or the vascular system that's been killed off, we may be inducing some hypoxia. 
Um, and if the doses are big enough, perhaps that, that's okay and we can deal with it and the duct cells will die anyway. But if they can escape the, the lethal damage, then those cells could still go on and um, regrow the tumour. So that can increase radio resistance again if the cells are not ablated or do not die of necrosis. There's more, unfortunately, repair of OARs is limited due to the lethal rather than sublethal damage. So we use highly modulated beams or arcs to spread out the normal tissue dose. Um, treatment errors, if they happen, um, have larger consequences. Um, and also the tumour movement, natural tumour movement in the body. Um, so that's toxicity and underdosing may occur at these high doses per fraction. You've got fewer fractions to um, account for this and apply a replant. So the QA um, for high risk procedures, obviously the QA processes and planning and staff time increases dramatically as does immobilization requirements, setup time, daily cone beam imaging to make sure we're delivering the dose in the right place. Um, and 4D CT is often used as well to really see where the tumours may move to or even um, LINAC treatments that are um, gated so that we're only delivering dose during a certain period, for example, of the breathing cycle. So lots of things to account for. In theory, it sounds um, mostly wonderful, but lots of things to account for and think about as well with stereotactic radiotherapy. Um, many big clinics are now applying this and have done so for a number of a short number of years um, with successful programs. Here's what a, an example of two target um, lung small cell non non small cell lung cancer example looks like with very tight conformal um, arcs of therapy used there in FEMAT to try and target um, small, relatively small legions, but with very high doses in only two, three or four fractions commonly. We won't have time to read through it now, unfortunately, but two really good references here by McMahon um, and Bustani, um, really going into more about the mechanisms of what's happening to alter that, um, the dose per fraction response as we get up to the higher doses, because the linear quadratic equation wasn't geared back in the day to accounting for all these different effects and the large doses per fraction, or even the very small, where there can be um, more effects going on than we previously thought. So these two uh, papers are quite good to read if you want to get more into it. And note there, it does reference the 10 gray mark where vascular effects can start to happen and reducing the vascular flow in the tumours and also maximising um, the immunity response of the, of the patient. Between that 10, 12, 13 sort of mark, we may be able to invoke that to help control our tumours. It's quite complicated, therefore, what's happening mechanistically to do this. And this is not my area of expertise, but I found this diagram quite interesting from um, Bustani et al. Um, so this paper is, is a really good one if you're interested, showing us that many different things about um, are, are going on at the intercellular level um, when we are at different doses per fraction. So the normal range, um, a moderate hypofractionation, and then our SABRE levels where much more immune invoking responses may be occurring. And this could be person or tumor type dependent, but this in general are some of the things that can be going on and they get quite complicated. So the, um, we might need our biology, um, cell biology friends to help us here and geneticists. Um, but yeah, this, this paper is a good one to read if you're interested in that, what, what is actually going on to have such a different response at the high doses. All right, we are nearly there. So. How do we account for some of this? Can we account for it in the LQ model? Because that was the topic of this talk. Well, it turns out despite all of these different responses, the LQ model is still relatively good. Um, and it is good perhaps up to 15 to 18 gray per fraction. Um, however, the LQ model tends to overestimate cell kill and becomes less accurate above around the 10 gray mark. Um, and that's because that's when those vascular effects um, are kicking in. So a more linear trend has been observed again after that quadratic trend. And I'll show you some plots about that. Um, so adjustments to the LQ model have been proposed and published um, for about the last two, two decades or just under, um, including um, a generalized LQ model, a universal survival curve model, um, a linear quadratic linear, linear quadratic cubic, and there are more. 
Um, so there's some references here if you're interested in the different models. I've just got one example here of some work I've done on the um, LQC, so cubic, adding a cubic component. Um, that's on the next slide. Um, these, however, only are best fits to LQ model um, using those alpha beta parameters, and they're not mechanistic reasoning for the vascular and immune, all those complicated cellular effects that are going on. But it might be a way that we can account for this in a basic model by extending the LQ model. The latter, so actually accounting for these may not be ever fully possible, but if it is, it's more likely to require um, complex spatial and sort of temporal dynamic systems to model the tumour or cell systems um, using stochastic or probabilistic type methods. But for now, if we're going to extend the LQ model, this was one of the possibilities. Um, these um, can be seen in uh, basic clinical radiology, uh, radiobiology book um, where the survival curve has that extra um, dose cubed factor. So the probability of survival. So similar to the LQ model, but with this extra term where this gamma factor is beta over three and then a DL parameter. And then it's up to the researcher to uh, do cell experiments or estimate, predict, you know, vary this with um, Monte Carlo modeling to try and see what this value should be. Um, so overall that LQ um, cubic model suggests that the line um, is shallowing and we don't have such a cell kill response at these higher levels. So putting this into a, um, testing this theory in some simulations. This is an example of some results using, um, modeling this theory in a 10 to the eight, 100 million cell hypoxic head and neck tumor, where reoxygenation was also um, accounted for in the modeling. And we plotted here um, the EQD2, with and without reoxygenation that was needed to kill every cell in that tumor that was that could have regrown it um, versus the actual total dose, the delivered dose. And the delivered dose, um, as you can see, goes down because we're delivering higher and higher doses per fraction. The EQD2 actually rose um, in this example. So um, I don't think we've got time to go into that anymore, but this is the reference for this paper from some of our group's uh, modelling work where we we're actually testing this linear quadratic cubic theory of cell kill in a simulated tumour. Um, just to mention, this work showed that reoxygenation was indeed still important when there were nine fractions or two weeks of dose delivery, um, but when it, the doses per fraction increased severely and the fractions required reduced severely, um, then reoxygenation didn't matter. So that was one result that we came out with. In summary, Sabre doses deliver a relatively new for non-cranial EBRT compared to the linear quadratic model, which was developed around 50 years ago. So this technique uses very large doses per fraction in only a few fractions, and four by 12 gray is quite common. Extending the LQ model for cell survival to predict these high dose per fraction responses has been discussed and around for about two decades um, due to observations of lower rates of cell kill than expected in vitro and linear trends to the S survival curve above around 10 gray per fraction. Uh, many radiobiological phenomena and mechanisms have been postulated and some have been proven to explain some of these responses, um, have uh, increased hypoxia um, and immune response invoked um, are really big points of interest in research at the moment, as well as these abscopal effects, where the immune system is actually helping kill tumour cells away from the primary site and away from the fields, which is very beneficial. Um, although the complex and dynamic system um, characteristics cannot be modelled um, with a simple equation like the LQ model, um, some have been reported and extended, as we've talked about, such as the LQ cubic model, and that still has very good accuracy up to around the 10 to 20 gray uh, dose per fraction level. All right, I think that is um, enough from, from me for this lecture thank very, three. Thank you And very I thank you for listening for all of those four topics. It was a lot to get through. We do have two um, live polls um, with some question sets. So I think I might hand back to 
the organisers, but I'll show the questions on my screen because the YouTube channel um, participants may not be able to see this Dr. only on the Zoom. So I'll, I'll scroll through so you can see the first question. Hello, Dr. Bendy. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. You can take over if you like. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, due to That's the time interest, is it, can we uh, change the schedule, uh, schedule a little bit? So the quiz probably, if we have time at the end of the second lecture. Sure. So uh, we might uh, do that at the end of the second lecture. So no problem. Thank you very much for your very comprehensive and informative talks. Uh, that's excellent. Um, <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, I, I, I think everybody is uh, enjoying. Um, mm -hmm. So can, we, uh, can you please unshare your screen, please? Sure. So the next, uh, uh, as, as usual, uh, all, thanks for the uh, active participation in the uh, chat room. And you can still pose your questions. We'll try to address your questions at the end of the session. So, uh, so uh, next slide, please. Due to the time interest, can I introduce you uh, with our next speaker, Professor Dr. Fuad Ismail. So thanks Dr. Fuad for, for, your, uh, for willing to be our lecturer today. So Prof. Fuad, uh, he is a medical lecturer at Medical Faculty, the National University of Malaysia, UKM. He has uh, more than 20 years of the clinical oncology uh, experience and he is a head of the radiotherapy and oncology uh, departments at the UKM Medical Center. And he is one of the founding member of the Master of Clinical Oncology program at the University of Malaya. And he has more than 45 research projects and publish uh, a lot of work related to the cancer issues. And he's the chairman of the Research Active Committee at UKM and also the Senate, Senate members of the UKM. And he also the committee members for both a very important uh, committee, which is a technical advisory committee for health technologies, economic evaluation, as well as the evaluation committee for specialist uh, medical qualification for oncologies at the MMA in Malaysia. Without further ado, can I invite Prof. Wat? Prof. Wat, the floor is yours. Prof. Wan. Thank you. Um, Thanks. I'll start sharing my slides. Yes, please. Okay. Yep, can you see it? Not at the moment. No worries. No worries. Currently, we have about 147 participants in Zoom. All right. Seems like the screen sharing. Yep. Looks wonderful. Prof, the floor is yours. Can hear me? Yes. Yep, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Yep. So this is the topic I was asked to talk about treatment and interruption and retreatment. Our combined therapy. I've actually changed it just a little bit because uh, I think this is what we are interested in: re-irradiation, um, treatment interruptions, and combined therapy. I must admit, I am uh, very much a clinician, so I'm going to talk more on a clinical perspective rather than uh, very strongly on radio biology perspective. Uh, that's a bit out of my uh, scope of work. So um, we know that radiotherapy is a very important modality for cancer treatment and many studies have shown that about 50% of cancer patients need it in, uh, somewhere during their course or their journey through their cancer, either in the curative or palliative setting. We've done our own little study here in the university and our numbers also is about 50% of patients here uh, needing radiotherapy at some point in time. And we are doing better in terms of treatment of uh, cancer patients. So there are more long-term cancer survivors. 
and hence they are now at more risk of developing either recurrent disease, sometimes the disease come back later than you think it, uh, it normally does, or they may get a new primary cancer. And part of this reason is due to some patient factors, either some of them may have certain specific genetic abnormalities, or they have a common uh, denominator, such as especially as smoking. Uh, the, uh, smoking is very pertinent in terms of re radiation. And smoking, as you know, may cause cancer in many different parts of your body, including oral, uh, oral cavity, lung, bladder, stomach, etc. And of, of course, some of the risks of cancer include the risk from uh, treatment, especially radiotherapy and chemotherapy. Uh, now we need to differentiate what we mean by retreatment versus re-irradiation because uh, Peter McCallum reported some years ago on the review of over 48,000 patient records, those who received radiotherapy over a 12 year period, and they found that one in five patients or 20% needed to be retreated. Uh, and patients who had radical treatment had a retreatment rate of about 13% compared to 45% of those who had treatment for palliative intent. But here, this is a difference. And the retreatment rate was defined as the number of patients who were prescribed more than one course of radiotherapy. That means it may not be at the same site. It's just that you may have had one bone metastasis and later you may need um, palliative radiotherapy to another site bone metastasis. When we talk about re-irradiation, then we are looking at treatment to the same site. So because of um, increasing technology, we have better modality of radiotherapy. We are, have more refined radiotherapy. There's been an increase or surge in interest in re-irradiation and there's been increased frequency of re-irradiation studies in radiation oncology. <clears throat> so if you look at the sites that people most often consider for re-irradiation, they are especially the head and neck cancers, uh, one third of those brain tumors and also bone metastasis. So re-irradiation is very complex. It's a nightmare for clinicians. Yeah? It's a very difficult and complex undertaking because the patients are a vast group. They are quite heterogeneous and you know you can get the young and the old um, patients who've been smokers, uh, patients who are of variable, uh, variable fitness. They have had a lot of initial therapy before and they, have, and they may, have, may not have tolerated the initial radiotherapy well and other treatment including surgery and chemotherapy. They are older because this is a recurrence or retreatment and they may have new comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, etc. Um, the location and extent of tumors that is, treated with, uh, that is to be retreated may be different. And one of the issues uh, is you are now less certain, quite often less certain where exactly the tumor starts and ends because the normal tissue planes and normal anatomy are lost due to previous therapy, especially surgery, and also uh, radiotherapy, which tend to blow out the normal tissue boundaries. So you, you also have a variety of initial radiotherapy param parameters. Many of us use two grades per fraction for radical treatment, but patients who receive Palliative treatment may have a variety of fractionation. And uh, sometimes, even worse, is that the patient may have had treatment in another center and he is well, then he comes, he's, he's moved, uh, moved from his original place of work and you can't even get the data from the old center. That, that's, and that happens occasionally as well. The time from re initial radiotherapy is very important. You, the, if patient recurs soon after radiotherapy, then it's probably not worth it. Was what to treat, so whether it's one year, two years, or three years, but basically, the longer you are from your initial radiotherapy, then the better it is. Uh, but we are still struggling in terms of what we know about no, uh, normal tissue recovery, and there is limited data. A lot of the data is actually from animal models and so on. So, the data on re irradiation for, for many sites is still uh, sparse. So, what are the risks of re, -ir re irradiation? So for a clinician, when a tumor recurs at the same area of previous radiotherapy, then we are, we are a bit stuck. This is a real dilemma whether we should repeat radiotherapy. Now, if the tumor has recurred soon after radiation, then it's, it's probably not worthwhile because this is a radio-resistant tumor. But if you have a fit patient and he has a dominant, inoperable, symptomatic tumor, uh, somewhere he has been irradiated before, then it's very challenging. Patients who are fit tend to live a long time and then they, they will live longer to potentially suffer the effects of cancer as well as 
potentially suffer the effects of your treatment to him. If the tumor is dominant, uh, then it is an issue. If the tumor is has disseminated throughout the body, then you know that you don't really need localized therapy. This is an indication for systemic therapy, especially chemotherapy. And uh, as our usual uh, paradigm is whenever you have a treatment that uh, a tumor that's recurred from, say, radiotherapy, then if it's operable, you try to remove it. Um, uh, say, a, a good tumor site would be the larynx. If you have a recurrent tumor from, from uh, post-radiation, then you, you offer total laryngectomy for this patient. But if the tumor is inoperable, then it's, then it's a problem. Uh, you are stuck with either radiotherapy or systemic treatment. And of course, if the, sim, uh, the treatment is symptomatic, the, the tumor is symptomatic, then the patient does need some symptom release and you are forced to um, give, offer some treatment for them. So some of the factors to be considered when you are thinking about re release include the tumor. Is this a recurrence or is this a second primary? If it's a recurrence and it's a recurrent very quickly, then it's no point. This is a resistant tumor. But if re it has recurred some years later, then this tumor is moderately radiosensitive and um, retreatment may be considered. A second primary tumor means you've cured the first tumor, hopefully, and then you have a new uh, lesion which may be equally radiosensitive. Then you you are you need to consider what is the type of tumor whether it's a radio sensitive tumor like squamous cancer or is it radio resistant tumor? Of course, the worst scenario is usually you, when you develop a sarcoma in the in the previously irradiated field and this tend to be radio resistant uh, to your radiotherapy and may not be worthwhile to re irradiate a previous site. And the size of the tumor, the size of the recurrence of any tumor uh, and the volume uh, is very important because that would influence the area that you need to irradiate. And if there's any nodes involved, again, this will indicate that you need to irradiate a very large area. Yeah? And of special mention is when you have tumors in the head and neck region and you need to have local uh, radiotherapy. Uh, interestingly, um, certain organs or certain structures which you think are highly radio resistant becomes important when you are considering re irradiation and we are involved by tumor, then it's even more important to consider the possibility of um, uh, adverse events in these uh, uh, structures. Professor, sorry to yes. disturb your flow. Uh, but do you mind to unshare and then share the slide again? Uh, because uh, someone accidentally wrote on it, so it's not showing clearly. Oh, okay. All right. My apologies. <laughs> no worries. Let's see how do we do this. Okay. Okay, are we all right? Can you yes. see the slides? Yeah, okay. Yes, perfect. Uh, can you make it into presentation? Okay, hold on. I think I have to redo this. Just give me a second. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, is that in presentation mode? Uh, no, it's not in display mode, no. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Now, thank you so okay. much. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Good. I, my technical help has arrived. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I think it's in presentation mode now. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so uh, we talk about normal tissue factors, and again, um, different normal tissue can tolerate different retreatment. Yeah, they, they recover at different rates, and some uh, normal tissue have limited recovery, others have got better recovery depending on the type of tissues they are. So it depends whether they are. Parallel organs or serial organs. Uh, parallel organs, um, where the classical serial organ would be your spinal cord. Parallel organ will include your, your lung or your liver. Uh, what was the volume of tissue irradiated before? And again, time is very important. What are um, concurrent illnesses uh, of the patient, especially things which compromise the vasculature like diabetes and hypertension. You know that um, many of the late effects are due to vascular compromise and whether concurrent chemotherapy has been given before or is being planned uh, for this repeat radiation. 
When considering re-irradiation, the normal tissue damage and the impact on the quality of life must be considered. There is no free lunch. There will always be some effect and how, uh, how bad it will could it be for if you damage certain organs, you know, zero stoma is, is probably still acceptable, but having chronic skin ulceration or worse, myelopathy is definitely unacceptable. Prof. Okay. Huh? Sorry, would you mind to click on the presentation mode again? Okay. So uh, we have the contact paper, which was part presentation mode. Okay. I didn't, I didn't know this yeah, excellent. That's good. Okay, so you have the contact paper, and we can see that the, the, this is a, a good summary of um, the dose uh, fractionation. Uh, well, the total dose and the risk of events, uh, especially late radiation events to the different organs. So you can see that certain organs are very sensitive. Uh, brain is, is can tolerate quite a lot of radiation actually, but brainstem is quite sensitive and you can see that um, about 54 to 60 grade is the maximum that we will comfortably irradiate um, uh, brainstem or part of the brainstem. Yeah? So there, there's a lot of data in the Quantec uh, paper for for you to make an estimate on the risk of, um, uh, of complications um, relative to the normal tissue tolerance. <clears throat> okay, so if you're thinking of goals, uh, what are the goals of re-irradiation? Number um, one is, can you still cure this person, right? So if you want to try to cure, then you want, need to control the local disease, uh, whether it's with radiation by itself, a definitive radiotherapy, or is it going to be post salvage surgery as an adjuvant radiotherapy? or adjuvant re-irradiation uh, for the patient? Or is it just for palliation? And then we want to offer a reasonable uh, length of local control and palliation of symptoms. So very careful patient selection is essential. Those who are uh, who should, not, should not be related include those who are poorly. That means their uh, performance status is very poor. Um, and anybody who is performance status three definitely should not be radiated. The best is zero to one um, equal status. Those who've had severe toxicity from previous radiotherapy and those who have uh, disseminated disease or metastatic carcinoma. So the basic principles in re-irradiation is one is never do this alone. You do need input from a lot of people, including your friendly surgeon to see whether can you offer something else? Can you offer surgery up front first instead of radiotherapy? The radiologist will, will you need a lot of help from the radiologist to really define the tumor because again, um, knowing where the tumor extent is in a recurrent situation is really quite difficult. Uh, you need to really pay careful attention uh, with maximum care to the patient and accuracy of treatment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by this is if normally you just do a CT scan to, uh, to see the extent of the tumor, you may need all modalities, including MRI and PET scan to carefully delineate the extent of tumor with not only just um, uh, imaging, but also with functional imaging. So you have to look at little, little details in the uh, dose, uh, in the target volume, because certain areas of hotspot, you don't want the hotspot to land where the previous hotspot was, or you think where the previous hotspot was. So you may want to distribute the, the damage a bit more evenly. And you, when you want to consider the risk of further late effects, hyperfractionated protocols may be considered, uh, unless you have a very, very small volume of, of disease and then you may consider very highly conformal image guided stereotactic approaches. Uh, typically would be something like doing a gamma knife for a re radiation of brain tumors. So, so it is important to look at what is the most important tissue in the area that you're going to re radiate because the probability and severity of late complication is related to the tissue hierarchy. I mentioned this before, serial organ is very sensitive to hotspot and uh, damage to a serial organ is disastrous. So if you have a, a volume which has been treated and it's a parallel system, then overdosing these areas is not as bad as overdosing organs with serial uh, functional units. Yeah? So the assessment includes the, the safety re-irradiation re should be especially focused to these organs. Yeah? Most important would be spinal cord, brachial plexus, and bowels. 
Although I must con uh, admit that we seldom consider re radiation in the abdomen or in the pelvis. So it's looking at spinal cord, then the long-term risk is myelopathy. Uh, for the first, uh, first um, cause of radiation, then the risk of myelopathy, if you keep the dose below somewhere between 50 or 55 days, uh, we can argue, uh, argue about this, then the risk is actually very small. It's probably less than 1%, and it goes up to about 5% or less for doses up to about 60 days. And the spinal cord does recover. Uh, so if you need to re-irradiate, uh, if it's after a year, then there is substantial recovery. And if you do re-irradiate, then you need to keep the cumulative BED below 135 degrees or thereabouts. And you should never give more than the equivalent BED of 98 degrees per course of treatment. So that's a spinal cord. And, and as a clinician, I must admit that this is the one that we are most paranoid about because long-term risk of myelopathy is disastrous for the patient when they become uh, uh, quadriplegic or hemiplegic uh, or, or diplegic. Yeah? The second area that we often re-irradiate is brain. And, and especially for certain tumors, let's say for uh, interestingly for something like lung cancer, where previously if you have brain metastasis uh, for lung cancer usually just means disseminated disease and the patient is likely to die of metastatic spread. But with um, increasing improvement of systemic therapies, especially the targeted therapies, seeing isolated brain um, metastasis and needing retreatment is getting to be uh, less uncommon now. So if you are treating um, uh, metastasis, uh, especially when you have used uh, whole brain radiotherapy before then, you need to consider stereotactic radiosurgery of some sort. And then here, the volume of tumor becomes very important and you need to adjust your doses according to the size of the recurrent tumor. Bone metastasis is another area we, we often either retreat, that means a different site, or you need to re-irradiate. And uh, this is one of our bread and butter of radiotherapy where you get very good pain relief for treatment of bone metastasis. And many, many studies have shown that single fraction is as good as multiple fraction. However, there is uh, an increased uh, re irradiation or retreatment um, rate with single fraction radiotherapy, which is about 20% versus just under 10% with uh, fractionated treatment. This may be a true, um, a true phenomena or it may be because that if you have given a smaller dose to a certain area, if you're given, let's say, eight grades to a certain site in the bone, then you are um, less unwilling to retreat it because you still have got quite a lot of scope for uh, re-irradiation to the same area. And single, a single fraction is, is the best for, uh, in terms of logistics for the patient and the caregiver. Now, interestingly, when you start to re-irradiate, then you have to worry about certain um, new organ or new structure toxicity. Right? Many of these structures we don't really consider as important. Let's say if you give radiotherapy to the head and neck region, we seldom think about the tolerance of the carotids uh, or, or the aorta in the thorax. Uh, uh, but when you have re-radiation, then you do see some large vessel complication. And uh, arterial rupture has been seen with re-irradiation in the head and neck thoracic regions, uh, especially in the carotid and the thoracic aorta. Now, there's been very little report of, of the abdominal aorta, and it may be also a good function of, that we see we do much less uh, abdominal radiotherapy compared to thoracic or chest radiation. The reported rate for this is about 2 to 3%. And if you have tumors which are surrounding the vessels or if there's alteration in the skin and previous neck dissection, and these are additional risk factors for large vessel rupture. Right? And, and if it, normally with head and neck radiotherapy, you only see risk of osteoradionecrisis of about 1%. This increases rapidly with uh, re repeat radiation as well as tracheal necrosis. So I will go to the uh, main area of um, re irradiation, especially in head and neck cancers. Yeah. Uh, patient with head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, SCC head and neck, are at risk of getting second round of radiotherapy because they have a, a relatively high incidence of getting either a regional relapse, about 30%, or getting a second cancer, which is about 5% per year. The second cancer may be elsewhere, but they do get cancer in the same area because it's an effect, especially of smoking, where you get field cancerization and the whole uh, upper aero digestive um, tract is affected by chronic smoking. And again, because of better radiotherapy, hopefully, um, the probability of developing um, second 
cancers increases as patients are surviving longer and they may also see late local regional recurrences. Is retreatment warranted? It is always a big dilemma. Is, can, uh, um, should we re-irradiate them? And, and it may be worthwhile because we can see what happens if we don't treat patients. They die quite quickly. There is no such thing as five-year overall survival uh, in general if the patient got a or a new head and neck primary tumor, but in the, the head and neck squamous carcinoma with re-irradiation, they don't do as well, and most the median survival is less than a year, which is similar to systemic uh, therapy. So here, here lies the choice of whether you should uh, avoid re-irradiation and simply offer the patient cis therapy uh, upfront. So, so again, you can see on um, five-year survival is only really realistically seen when the patient can undergo surgery and followed by possibly adjuvant treatment. We've got publications which, which suggest that um, that the newer radiation modalities may be uh, helping us to um, uh, allow get, get more patients for, for retreatment. We know IMRT can offer more conformal um, radiotherapy and especially in the context of re-radiation, you may have more constraints so that you avoid certain very vital organs, especially in the head and neck region such as the spinal cord. And in this publication, we can see that the use of IMRT uh, versus uh, non-IMRT, there are better, there's a better chance of local uh, regional control with the use of IMRT um, in, in, in the head and neck region. Right. The RTOG has done a couple of big studies looking at re-irradiation um, protocols and this was uh, in the head and neck uh, um, cancers. Most of them in the oropharyngeal region and there's a lot of uh, entry criteria for, for this uh, protocol. One is, of course, it must be proven to be a recurrent squamous carcinoma and then you must, it must be a longish time interval, at least six months. And the dose of radiotherapy number seven cannot be too much, it's a maximum of 75 dose. And the anticipated cumulative spinal cord dose was limited to 50 grays. Yeah, so you can see that these are, um, uh, if we are thinking of a re irradiation, this again, we should look at all these criteria and think that we should try to follow this, especially the dose constraint of not too, too much dose to organs at risk. Yeah. So in the final report, um, how, uh, unfortunately, it was not too exciting because you can see that the graph of overall survival is pretty dismal. Very few patients survive uh, beyond two years. Yeah. The rate of survival of two years is only about 10% or so. And, and this is uh, uh, patients who, ha who had prior radiotherapy and recurred quickly, that means less than a year, they do very poorly, and most of them die within a year of treatment. And those who ha had uh, more than a year lapse after the initial radiotherapy do a little bit better. And by, and by the graph, you can see it is just a little bit better. And the mortality, the good thing about the mortality in the radiotherapy, I'm not taking, saying it's good to be mortality, but most of it was actually related to cancer rather than to our treatment. So that is the risk you know, why you need to consider re-irradiation because patients will die of uh, uncontrolled tumor if you don't re-treat them. So the risk uh, of mortality related to complication of the protocol was quite low, only about 10% uh, overall. However, morbidity was quite considerable and you can see here just uh, selected uh, the use of feeding tube and you can see that um, most of the patients would have needed a feeding tube at some point in time. And you can imagine, uh, even after the first round of radiotherapy, most of the patients have difficulty in swallowing because they have dry mouth, it's uncomfortable, they may have aspiration issues and so on. So there is considerable morbidity um, following re-irradiation to the head and neck region. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there was also another uh, trial, RTOG uh, 1911, where they look at uh, uh, re-irradiation with um, platinum or uh, paclitaxel. And again, uh, similar to this, except that this was a trial where the salvage surgery was manda uh, mandatory uh, with macroscopic complete resection. And here, the radiotherapy is quite intensive. They actually had BID treatment, hypofractionated, and they received uh, 60, 60 grays of radiotherapy. And if you look at this graph and you say, okay, that looks quite good, except that the 
uh, X axis is a bit expanded. So the one year survival is maybe about 40% and the two years it may be about 25% uh, overall survival. But you can see that they do recur quite rapidly and almost two thirds of the patient will recur by one year and uh, seen in the PFS graph. <coughs> surgery, um, <coughs> uh, uh, surgery is uh, does offer um, some advantage over just definitive irradiation. So you know, I see some patients that definitely irradiation. You can see that getting surgery um, improves their overall survival by about five to ten percent, and and also reduces the risk of local regional failure in these patients. Um, in the two arms that, that were, who had surgery, one arm was actually offered chemo radiotherapy as adjuvant and the other arm was watchful waiting. And you can look at this graph and you can say that, that yes, it is good. If we offer um, radiotherapy, they do get improved in DFS, disease-free survival. Um, but when you treat patients for potentially a curative treatment, then you have to look at the overall survival as well. And here, the, the overall survival um, was not much different from within this, these two arms. So, so there is always a price to pay in terms of giving treatment upfront, more, being more aggressive versus being more conservative and perhaps giving radiotherapy a bit later. Right? And you can see here the disease-free uh, survival has improved, but there is considerable mobility, especially the lower part. You look at the skin, uh, trismus, radio osteoradio necrosis is all quite high. Osteoradio necrosis seen in 17% of the patient versus uh, watchful waiting arm, which is essentially zero. So you can improve that disease free survival by starting treatment early um, after surgery and being more aggressive, but there is a, a price to pay in terms of long term morbidity. And you can see here that the long term morbidity of grade three toxicity is quite high at about 15% for, for these patients. But most of the patients actually succumb to the disease uh, uh, eventually, and uh, almost seventy percent of them. So, how can we select our patients out for re-radiation? We will come across these patients, uh, these sort of patients, many times, and it's always a, a dilemma in trying to persuade patients to undergo re-radiation um, both ways, actually, whether the patient wants to undergo re-radiation or whether the physician wants to re-radiate a person. So if you look at the two main um, uh, things to consider, whether they have comorbid disease, do they have bad heart, do they have bad diabetes, is there, is there any organ uh, dysfunction prior to radiation? And when you have um, these two factors together, then there are bad prognostic factors and essentially there are very, uh, or no survivors beyond two years uh, when they have both of these. So assuming that your patients do not have severe comorbidities, then you look, where is the recurrence? If you have isolated neck recurrence, you do better. If the tumor is smaller, then you do better. Again, this is very intuitive. And if you have a longer time interval, then again, you do better as you seen in the previous study. So you look at what's happening. So if the, uh, if the patient is being, has a recurrent tumor, then is it, when was the radiotherapy? If it's more than two years, uh, and then it's resected, they do the best. Yeah, they should, you should, uh, you can consider them for radiotherapy. But if they, they, the radiation was less than uh, two years and there's organ dysfunction, then they do quite poorly. And, you know, to give them um, radiotherapy may not be the best for them because they, they will have considerable morbidity and they will not um, survive very long either. Um, so we often use uh, cisplatin for our concurrent radiotherapy treatment. Um, I do use some carboplatin and paclitaxel as well. And we have a whole bunch of new um, agents coming out. Cetuximab was very exciting when it came out about 10 to 15 years ago. But over, over time, that we can see that uh, Cetuximab is actually not much better than cisplatin. And in this re-irradiation series also, it shows that the results were similar whether you use cisplatin or Cetuximab. Okay, so that's the first part on re-irradiation. I'm going to go on to talk about a little bit about treatment interruption. This is going to be much shorter. Um, just, uh, just to walk you through this. And we know the five hours of radiotherapy. Uh, when you give radiation, the cells uh, um, uh, survival improves after some hours because of repair of subdital damage. And if you you re-irradiate them at a certain time point, this is a two-fraction um, radiotherapy, then because of reassortment, the cells become sensitive again to radiation and then the cell survival decreases again. 
But the last part of the graph is the part that is really important is when there is too long a gap between radiation, then there is repopulation of cells and the tumor may actually be bigger uh, um, uh, after the first fraction of radiotherapy. So as for us, I think uh, we do have treatment interruption during radiotherapy. They may be planned. Split cross radiotherapy um, was done in the past to reduce the acute side effect of treatment. I think split cross radiotherapy is mostly in the back burner now, and um, um, no one will really consider split cross radiotherapy for radical treatment. But often patients uh, may have unplanned gaps, yeah, uh, and this may be due to illness. Um, God forbid if they get COVID now. Uh, or they may have severe side effects from treatment needing hospitalization and supportive care, or it may be technical. Partly, uh, the biggest one would probably be in Malaysia, maybe holidays, and the second one is machine breakdown because many of our centers have one or two machines only, so um, the treatment time is very uh, tight and machines are often old. And why are gaps important? Gaps are really important because we do not want to increase the overall treatment time. This is a publication about 30 years ago, um, which looked at the risk of uh, repopulation in tumor. Uh, this is by Withers et al. And with, uh, you can see that the graph, by prolonging the treatment duration beyond about 30 days, then the total dose needed is increased from 50 grays to 70 grays by the time you hit a treatment duration of 60 days. So this was due to uh, um, uh, tumor repopulation and accelerated repopulation. So treatment interruptions are very, very important for fast growing tumor with potentially a short T-pot. The average doubling time of a squamous carcinoma is supposed to be about 30 to 60 days. But if you interrupt the cell kinetics and the tumor kinetics, then the tumors can repopulate with a, a doubling time of between four to seven days. And from the same publication, they say that uh, overall looking at the different studies, then the, the, the increment dose needed per day loss is about 0 0.6 grays. Of course, it's quite difficult to know how this means in terms of transition or, of um, local control, um, uh, but that would, uh, that would be about 1% 1, 1 or so less local control per day loss. Okay. So this is, a, this is a graph looking at the different kinetics of the different areas. So the tumor starts to undergo accelerated repopulation in about four weeks plus minus one week. Uh, but you can see your, uh, your normal tissue, your acute reacting tissue will start to undergo a, uh, so called accelerated repopulation after about one to two weeks. So, so in terms of um, uh, treatment, uh, if you prolong the treatment too long, then both these tissue, two tissue, the tumor tissue and the normal tissue are um, repopulating at a fast rate. So therefore, uh, for head and neck cancer, it is best to try to complete your treatment in the shortest time possible. If you do have a gap and you need to compensate for it, there are a few ways that you can do it. Uh, sorry. Uh, one is you can increase the fraction size, but unfortunately, if you increase the fraction size to catch up for the lost days, then you run into a different problem because mm -hmm. the different tissues have got a uh, different sensitivity to increasing or different fraction sizes. You know that the late reacting tissues are more sensitive to fraction size. And uh, if possible, that it's best to maintain the overall treatment and fraction size. This is the easiest. Uh, scheme, but it is easier said and done. If the gap occurs early in the treatment, then we have the luxury that we can treat twice a day with minimum of six hours or better eight hours between fraction. And and some uh, we although mostly we work five day week, but we can actually uh, force um, not quite force, but we can we can ask the radiographer nicely to treat patients on Saturdays uh, for those who are on radical radiotherapy. But whatever it is, as a general rule, try not to treat more than six fractions a week because then the toxicity would increase. Yeah? So overall treatment time is very, very important for squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck and also of the cervix. For every day uh, of prolongation of the treatment time, then local control is decreased by about 1.5% 1 for head and neck tumors and by about 0.5 to 1% for uh, cervical carcinomas. For other tissues like say like breast or prostate tumors, the rapid proliferation is not seen, so compensation is not as crucial. So if you need to make a judgment, both um, breast is undergoing ra uh, adjuvant radiotherapy and prostate cancer is uh, undergoing radical radiotherapy, but your machine needs to be fixed and it will take half the day. So you, you need to um, prioritize your uh, head and neck cancers uh, and your cervical carcinomas.
Okay, I'm going to move on to the combined modalities. Here, I'm not going to talk about uh, surgery. I'm going to talk about more of the combining drugs with radiation. Yeah, We do combine surgery and other form of treatment with radiotherapy, but drug radiation interaction is important. And many drugs can cause modification of cellular response to radiotherapy. And we have many, many new drugs which can potentially be used as radiation sensitizer. Basically, a sensitizer is any drug or any agent that increases the sensitivity of radi uh, cells to radiation and a protector is one that reduces the sensitivity. So this is our typical dose response curve of um, tumors uh, or even normal tissue. Is, uh, we think it follows a sigmoidal pattern. Where, uh, the stiffness of the graph may vary. Yeah. So you start to see, you hope, at least you hope you start to see complication after you start to cure some patients of their tumors, right? So the complications hopefully come later. Yeah, so you, you select a, a, a good dose where you want to cure a certain number of tumors, but at the same time, not run into too many complications. I think a 5% risk of late complication is what is acceptable, okay? If you have a radio sensitive tumor, then that's nice. If you have a lymphoma, then you can cure most of them with radiotherapy, provided they're localized, and you run to very little risk of complications. But if you have a very radio resistant tumor, then the graph may be very close to your normal tissue tolerance, and it is difficult to cure this patient without running into late complications. So you want to use drugs to uh, help your radiotherapy, make it better. This is synergistic. It may work by preventing repair of radiation-induced damage. Um, classical would be cisplatinum. It may synchronize cells into radiation-sensitive phase. Remember the graph I showed earlier that certain phases of radiotherapy is more sensitive, especially G2. And then you may want to use the drug to prevent repopulation. Um, we know that hypoxic cells are um, more radio resistant and some drugs may help to reduce the fraction of hypoxic cells or sensitize them to radiotherapy. And of course, the drugs may work independently and kill cells which may be potentially radio resistant, but they may, they may be chemosensitive. So some of the potential disadvantages include that once you give chemotherapy, especially in the new adjuvant uh, setting, you may select out the chemo resistant and there are also radio resistant clones. Yeah. And if you give uh, chemotherapy, you have changed the cell kinetics, and by the time you start radiotherapy, you may have induced accelerated repopulation. And now we are playing a game of catching up, trying to give enough radiotherapy to control the tumor, although it is smaller. Then, of course, if you give chemotherapy, apart from sensitizing the tumor, you may also sensitize your normal tissues, and then you lose any advantage of uh, adding chemotherapy. And giving chemotherapy to patients may make them weaker. They may be having a severe side effects on chemotherapy, unable to eat, and therefore the tolerance to overall treatment, especially to radiation, becomes less. Right. So chemotherapy can interact with radiotherapy in different ways. Special cooperation means they work at different sites. A classical example would be leukemia, where, where previously we used to irradiate um, the brains of children. That hence the chemotherapy work in the rest of the body and radiotherapy will be given as prophylaxis mm -hmm. for potential intracranial disease. Chemotherapy can work on as independent uh, from radiotherapy, affecting different cell population. Those, some may be sensitive to chemo, some may be sensitive to radiotherapy. Um, uh, drugs may be protecting normal tissue and hopefully not protecting tumor tissue. And drugs, we want them to enhance the tumor response to our radiation. <clears throat> So I've mentioned this already and leukemia uh, and uh, uh, when it says non-interaction, the chemotherapy and radiotherapy are working completely independent of each other at different sites. Uh, again, this is, I've mentioned this. Uh, so we are, when we combine um, uh, modalities, um, previously in the 70s and 80s, when the interaction was not well known, we used to, the studies used to reduce the dose of radiation because we were worried about long-term uh, side effects when you use two modalities together. Now we know that in general, radiation and chemotherapy should be given, the, at least the radiation should be given at a full dose, where if you are looking for independent therapy, you also give chemotherapy at full doses, but perhaps not together with radiotherapy. Yeah, But we need to keep an eye uh, on the toxicity and in general, you look for drugs which have different toxicity for, from radiotherapy. If you are irradiating the chest, you try to give drugs which uh, do not have uh, severe pulmonary toxicity and, and so on. Yeah. <clears throat> so certain drugs need to be avoided when you give concurrently with radiotherapy, especially in antibiotics. I would be really scared of giving either doxorubicin or epirubicin or even gemcitabine with uh, radiotherapy. 
and then you avoid drugs with recognized toxicity, giving methotrexate um, with radiation to the head and neck or to the spinal cord is probably not a good idea, or cyclophosphamide or bleomycin when you give lung radiation. And sometimes you may need to avoid concurrent treatment with these drugs. Okay, so we do use quite a lot of, of concurrent chemo radiotherapy nowadays. And the idea of giving a radiation sensitizer is to increase the tumor response more, uh, more than uh, with either chemotherapy or radiotherapy. But again, this is with a caveat of for a certain given complication rate. So the complication rate may rise as well, but the complication rate must not be rising faster uh, than the, tu uh, the tumor response rate. So the tumor response must be more than normal tissue toxicity, hence you get a therapeutic gain. So you're looking for uh, either synergistic or uh, an additive uh, effect on this, uh, on this um, combination therapy. Now, the problem is it is easy to show this effect if your dose response curve is linear, but the dose response curve for different tumors is, uh, or different uh, normal tissue is not linear and for tumors it's not linear either. Uh, so you may get organs which are very radio sensitive, like say like the bone marrow. So any changes in the radiation dose greatly affect the bone marrow, while the lung, the curve, the dose response curve for lung may be less steep and dose response curve for uh, skin um, is even less steep and hence you have uh, you have both the luxury of increasing the dose, but at the same time, it is more difficult to predict where the effect of the interaction would be in, uh, for different um, tissues. So if you look at bone marrow, a small increase of one gray can increase the toxi uh, toxicity or the late complication for practically zero to 50%, and two grays increase may, may make it up to 100% compared to lung or other organs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I work Current thinking about drug and radiation is usually concurrent. We do use quite a bit of sequential, um, uh, but the advantage of adjuvant uh, and new adjuvant treatment for, uh, especially for uh, head and neck cancer and squamous cancer is much smaller than the advantage of giving concurrent treatment. And the main uh, advantage is probably the prevention or repair for, of radiation induced, induced damage, especially by cisplatin. Uh, perhaps there is a little bit of prevention repopulation, um, although I must say I think this is a very minor because the dose of platinum use is usually low per week. Um, and of course, there may be a little bit of effect of cy uh, cytotoxicity. So if you are using a radiation sensitizer, the, it is, ideally it should be selective in tumors, no effect on normal tissue. It should reach tumors in adequate concentration and we know that tumors are often hypovascularized and health drugs may not reach them in adequate concentration. You must also know when they are reaching the tumor so that you can time the radiotherapy. Um, this, is, this is more towards uh, radiation protector, protector rather than sensitizers. And you should be able to uh, administer the radiation sensitizer, ideally with every treatment, but in general, that's not very practical. So uh, many of our regimes, we use it weekly, especially the infusional regime. And hopefully the drug itself it has little toxicity and we can manage the enhancement of uh, radiotherapy uh, if it's predictable. Yeah. So I'm going to skip this and look at this. Uh, some kind of the categories of radiation sensitizers include the halogenous pyrimidine. Uh, the main one would be 5-fluorouracil and all the similar products. Report inhibition, cisplatin is our main drug now and they form DNA crosslink inhibiting repair radiation damage. Um, we do use some paclitaxel and cell, cellular studies show that you can use paclitaxel to induce a G2M block. Uh, and then this is the more sensitive, radio sensitive phase of the cell cycle. But in, in the clinic and in, uh, in a tumor in situ in your patient, it is very difficult to predict when the G2M block will happen and, and so it, it, this is probably not the main mechanism. We've seen these results with cisplatinum in many tumor sites. Now this is a publication over 20 years ago looking at effect of cisplatin in cervical cancer and there are many publications showing an advantage of about between 5 to 15 percent in terms of improved uh, treatment with cisplatin. This particular trial was the effect of pelvic radiotherapy, chemotherapy versus extended field radiotherapy just by itself. Yeah. So currently we are using um, mainly chemotherapy with um, uh, 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 concurrently with radiation for cervical cancer, esophagus, 
in the cancer, head and neck cancer, um, uh, non small cell, small cell lung cancer, and uh, for us, um, especially in NPCs, initial pharyngeal cancers. Yeah, uh, again, uh, uh, when we were uh, when the initial publication of concurrent chemo radiotherapy came out, many worried about late effect on bowel and bladder toxicity. We know that there is an increased acute effect with chemotherapy, but most of these are hematological and are uh, limited. But late toxicity has not been uh, too much of an issue with um, uh, concurrent chemo radiotherapy. We also know that, that we need to maintain the dose of radiotherapy to the full dose. And we, we have to be extra careful that the chemotherapy is not making the patient weaker and hence and needing to um, prolong treatment time. So if you do need to stop one treatment, you need to stop the chemotherapy and not the radiotherapy. So we have evidence looking at the data supporting combining chemo and radiotherapy together. Glioblastoma use a lot of timosolomide. Many of the other cancers we use, um, uh, cisplatin, we use uh, in, in inner cancer, we, we use mitomycin C, and in rectal cancer, we use more fluororesyl or uh, capecitabine. And some of the use of these combined modalities may be to um, limit the toxicity with one another modality. Well, one good example would be for uh, lymphoma, where you give your uh, chemotherapy as the main treatment, and sometimes you have um, chemo resistant disease and you can top it up or give some uh, curative radiotherapy for localized disease. So, this may be some of the advantage. You can reduce the, the dose of chemotherapy, the cycles of chemotherapy may reduce the exposure to certain drugs causing my cardiomyopathy by giving them radiation instead of, of chemotherapy. So, but again, um, uh, there is the price to pay. So, giving two modalities means you do add the toxicity. So, if you give a, a, a doxorubicin with radiotherapy, there, is, mm -hmm. there, there may be recall reaction and there may be some different late toxicities to the heart as well. As if you give, uh, let's say for breast cancer, you give um, doxorubicin followed by chest wall radiation. So, that may add some toxicity to the heart as well. So, always consider what is the or potential short and long term side effects when you give uh, chemotherapy with radiotherapy in, in whatever sequence. Yeah. So, uh, overall, however, again, as I said, in the right context, you do see an improvement in therapeutic death. This is what I'm alluding to. We can see that the therapeutic death is low in terms of acute side effects because you are getting much more side effects from chemotherapy, but these are limited. But more importantly, the late is uh, effect down. You can see that the effect with radiotherapy alone, the effect, uh, the ratio, the rate is similar to giving with, is with chemo radiotherapy. So this is a, a pattern that we've seen across many tumor sites. And uh, as radiation oncologists, most of us are uh, use a lot of concurrent chemo radiotherapy as a preferred modality. So in summary, uh, if you for re-radiation. Uh, patient selection is really, really important. Uh, pa patient need to be fit and you need careful counseling on risk. I didn't mention risk, which include uh, potential, um, uh, not just uh, in terms of for the patient, but in terms of for your career. A uh, very realistic risk is uh, the risk of litigation if things go wrong with three radiation. Right? So issues with radiation include the longer treatment time interval. So you try to read a patient who has at least one year from previous radiation. If you need to re-irradiate, you irradiate only the tumor. You don't. You generally don't do prophylactic nodal irradiation. Just whatever you see, so what, uh, that's why you irradiate. Uh, look at the OAR, mm -hmm. the organs at risk, and especially serial organs. Then those tolerances must be respected. Consider hyperfractionation and you know maybe BID treatment or something to to uh, maintain your overall treatment time. Yeah, so you need to pay attention, a lot of attention to supportive care and quality of life issues. Many of these patients will need supportive care in terms of feeding especially, and you need diligent documentation and reporting, especially the documentation because you need to show that you have uh, given consideration to all your organ tolerances because you remember that these patients are at very high risk of getting complications and you know um, uh, the, the potential uh, uh, difficulties ahead for yourself uh, when complications occur. So for, for chemo radiotherapy, so addition of drugs or chemotherapy with radiotherapy may uh, result in interactive or non-interactive uh, interactive. Here, what I mean is the drugs may work independently of radiotherapy or together with radiotherapy. Uh, I actually didn't mention much about radiation protector because uh, for me, I think they've come and gone. There's not much um, uh, interest in radiation protector nowadays. Uh, Non-interactive processes can be uh, has been demonstrated to have clinical beneficial effect. I mean, non, uh, um, you 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 can use radiotherapy and chemotherapy separately. You 
must remember this concept of therapeutic gain and it's only achieved if your your chemotherapy or drug results in an increased response relative to the increase in toxicity uh, to the normal tissues yeah uh, cis platinum and platinum combination so far for, for me at least uh, are the most useful um, drugs for concurrent treatment in several different sites of the body including head and neck chest and cervix so thank you very much uh, i will pass the I'll pass you back to the organizer. Thank you, Prof, for the very practical and informative talk. Thank you very much, Prof, uh, for, what, for your effort mm -hmm. and your time. So uh, before we move to the Q&A session, we'd like to do, uh, uh, Asya, would you mind to share the Q&A session, uh, the Q&A questions? So let me invite Prof. Watt again and uh, Dr. Vandy uh, Phillips. Vandy, uh, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, very interesting uh, lectures and we do uh, receive uh, about six questions in the chat room. So um, Prof. Watt and Dr. Vandy, would you mind to uh, um, have a look uh, with the questions and we might spend about um, sorry for the time delay. We might spend about uh, 10 minutes for this session and then we can conclude the session. Is it okay? Yeah, that's fine. This, Thank this, you. Look, this looks like an exam paper. <laughs> 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 so how do we select the kickoff time? <laughs> Quick photo. Let me, let, me, let me make it less terrifying for a while. <laughs> Is this better? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll just turn my volume. Uh, well, perhaps for the first one, selecting the kickoff time, that is difficult. Um, I've done modeling work to model this starting straight away, one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks after the start of radiotherapy uh, in a simulated sort of tumor. Um, two weeks corresponded best with um, trying to validate the model against literature or clinical data, but perhaps it's starting earlier. Um, as soon as tissue is injured in healthy tissue, it does start to respond and grow back, whether it grows back at a faster rate. And when that happens, it could be different in everyone. I'd say it's between two and four weeks generally, but um, no one may know for sure in, a, in an individual. So that, that's a very tricky one. <laughs> yeah, I... I can sort of do B, uh, number two, but not yeah. quite in the way that it was asked. Um, I think the, the, my first comment here would be as a clinician, this, is, this, this regime needs to be improved because you, you can see where your problem is, you, you, the, the gap in radiotherapy. And we, we seen this um, many years ago when we have treatments and we let the patient go back and then only we start the bracket therapy. Sometimes they, they don't feel so well and they don't turn up. So that's why our radiotherapy now is integrated with the brachytherapy and everything is completed in six weeks. Uh, it takes a little bit of logistics. It little, takes a little bit of uh, getting used to doing radiotherapy, uh, sorry, brachytherapy when the tumor is still big. But uh, in, in general, we, we would strongly uh, suggest not having a gap. I think that would be the best way. Otherwise, it is very difficult for you to compensate you are reaching the tolerance of your most of your pelvic organs with 50 grays plus 24 grays bracket therapy. It is, I, I feel like it's really difficult to increase the dose and uh, not run into a lot of late complications. So it is easier actually to change your um, treatment schedule. Yeah, we, we find the same, if I could add. Um, we have a one week break between our five weeks of external beam and then either only two or three fractions of brachytherapy with only one week break between um, and with an aim to less than 50 days total as one of the very most important factors um, in delivering the, the total dose. So you treat more than once a week? Um, not only once a week, um, but we're moving towards two by 10 gray, if not three by eight and a half gray. Yeah. Okay, That's great. So, oh wow! I'm not sure for that one. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, yeah, bro. bro I, as, 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 a, as a clinician, I am really scared of small bowel radiation. Um, um, 
you know, in in theory, in theory that you can irradiate, uh, uh, re-irradiate to a certain amount. I, I think hundred grace is is really high, but um, for a clinician, I, nothing makes a patient more miserable than bowel toxicity. In general, they get bloated, they they have diarrhea, they have bleeding, and um, uh, you know, unless you think that this is a curative situation, I, in general, would really not suggest re-rating um, um, some small bowel or duodenum uh, unless you're really desperate, you need, you need to stop bleeding or something like that. But, uh, but this, this is a clinician speaking rather than a radiobiologist. Wendy, what do you think? Yeah, I'm not, I don't know a whole lot about the re-irradiation side of things, only, for example, with brachytherapy, we have our either our 75 grey QD2 limits for the small bowel um, uh, and um, sigmoid um, and then up to the 90 for the bladder. But with re-irradiation, with that big break in between and some healing, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that, sorry. Yeah, probably the clinical judgment come into place at this. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah. can we it's really difficult as a clinician again it's really difficult to justify re-rating the bowel again unless you know you think you're going to cure but there's not many tumors in the abdomen that you can cure with re-irradiation so for me i think it's, it's a bit of asking for trouble agree can we move to the next one Asya? that looks like the same question Oh, it's the same question then. Sorry. Same in, yeah. I said, would you mind to, yeah. Perfect. Good. Well, increasing dose per fraction, and then as we've seen for Sabre, um, if you're basing it on very simple linear quadratic theory, that may not hold up and you may not be able to you know, get accurate predictions using either of those models with a basic alpha and beta um, parameter. Um, so increasing dose per fraction to a certain extent, you could use either. It depends on the literature reference value you were trying to aim for or the regimen you're trying to equate it to. So either could be used depending on your reference or your schedule you're comparing it to and what calculations has been made on that. Um, but when you get up high up to Sabre doses, as we've seen, a lot of other things are happening and you may not be able to use either. Um, that would be my general answer. <laughs> For the second question. So I think for, for the, uh, at the moment, um, Um, is there any particulars we'd like to address, uh, Prof. Ward and uh, Dr. Wendy, uh, at the moment? I have no more SBRT experience, so I... Yeah, no, no worries. So uh, perhaps due to the uh, time interest, can I uh, have a conclusion for this session? Yes. Uh, yeah, um, okay. So... Now we have uh, about 125 participants at the Zoom. Can we have a group photo, please? Can, uh, can you please, everybody, uh, turn on your video camera? We can have a group photo before we go to the end of the session. So uh, Asia was taking a uh, page by page. Uh, so I see everybody is quite uh, shy to turn on their, their camera. They're coming. Hi, everyone. Hello. All right, that's great. So I said we're taking the photo now. Have a smile. Right. I said, let us know when you're okay. Okay, one page done. One more page. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, I am done. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you, Asya. So, thank you, everyone. Thanks all for your great participation. And special thanks to our distinguished guests and speakers, uh, Dr. Vandy Phillips and Professor Dr. Fua Ismail for their knowledge uh, sharing and efforts in making this session a success. And thank you, everyone, for participating. And um, please fill in the, the feedback form uh, using the QR code here. And we'll issue... Uh, our committee will uh, send you the certification of a uh, participant uh, in the next few weeks time. And just uh, information, our third session of the workshop will take place on the next Friday, 23rd of April at the same time. Please join us again next week and see you and stay safe. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, uh, Prof. Wat, for a very, very important and interesting talk. You're Sorry. welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks Sorry. for inviting me. Sorry, Wendy, uh, for the for for can't uh, we can't uh, have the quiz session. That's fine. I went way too long, so that's my fault. <laughs> no, I I really uh because your talk is so so much of information, which is very important. So there was a lot to get through, wasn't there? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's not easy, but I, you did very well. Well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. And thanks to Prof. What Prof. Are you there? He may have gone. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So. I think we have a, a good session. We have about 200 participants today. Good. Yeah, from the yeah. YouTube and the Zoom session. So I think uh, we will, we will, um, so, and thanks for, for everything. Asya, Asya, are you there? Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, thank you very much for helping. Oh, and as well as uh, Hanyi, Hanyi, are you there? Yes, I'm there. I'm here. Thank you.